Well, hello there, everyone. This is another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council web presentation for May the 7th, 2020. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about keeping management intensive grazing affordable. But I've also got some other slides here kind of giving you an update of what things are doing this spring, at least for me at my operation, and uh, maybe give all of you guys some comfort in managing the spring that we're currently having. So let's get started. So this has been a tough spring to have to have cows out early. Uh, if you'd have asked me the end of March it, what I thought of spring and how things were going to go, I would have told you we were going to be out on pasture earlier than we ever had before. And luckily, I held on to the cows until the 13th of April, held on to the sheep until the 16th of April before I turned them out. And then I'm not sure we had any grass growth that entire first week they were out. And so by the end of the week, we were starting to get worried about what we were going to do. And the reason the grass just isn't growing for just isn't growing is it's colder than average temperatures. Um, Beth looked up somewhere that the average high temperature in January was higher than the average high temperature in April. And then also just wetness. And we've had some dry periods here in April, but, uh, and, and good enough that I could get some manure spread here and there. I've done some things out in the field, but we've still got wet weather springs just everywhere, seeping water. And that just tells me how wet things really are. Um, so we had to make a decision uh, where what we were going to do and, and what, were, what was going to happen if the grass didn't regrow. I, I wish now we had just held on to them, not turned them out until May 1st. I think in the future years, I, I will be looking hard at should I just hold on to them until May 1st uh, as a matter of principle. But we had to go back to our contingency planning and, and kind of decide where we were going to feed hay if we needed to. Our heavy use pads hadn't had a chance to be cleaned up yet this spring. I didn't really want to put them back there. Was was afraid they weren't even going to stay there if I did because I've only got one strand electric around the heavy use pad anyway. So uh, we thought about using a sacrifice area, but the area that we unrolled hay on last winter um, was starting to grow back. I'd already seeded it to something. Didn't really want to go in there and mess it up. Plus, it's got a lot of wet weather springs in that field anyway that we have to worry about in the spring. So, as luck would have it, we've got a field that we're going to plant the warm season grass this summer, and we're going to tear that field up anyway to do that. So, that was going to be the place that the cows were going to go back to to have hay. The sheep, I'm not so worried. They don't they don't eat very much, so I'm sure I'm sure we could rotate through. And uh, at that point, we gave ourselves a week. If, if things didn't grow, we were going to have to put them in and start feeding some hay. As luck would have it, we have got enough forage when the cows got back around to that field on their first rotation that we were going to feed hay on. There was enough forage growth out there to keep rotating. It looks rough in places. It's kind of patchy. Um, part of that is, is also because we've had so much frost and we've got another one coming in here this weekend. That we've got to worry about but things are coming back and and as i was thinking about doing this presentation last night on the way home from work uh, thinking about talking about this this topic in particular um I, I was thinking still about it's just not catching up the forage just isn't catching up lo and behold when i went up to move the sheep the the forage is really getting ahead of the sheep at this point so it will start getting ahead of the cows here too as things go on. So uh, the only thing to look out for now is the frost that we got coming here, I think uh, this weekend and what we're gonna do then. I told dad the other day, I'm gonna fence in the farm lanes and put the cows on the farm lanes for the nights that it frosts just so they don't do so much damage. Uh, but just wanted to, to talk a minute about how things were going. I've had a lot of sleepless nights here in the last week worrying about whether we're going to have enough grass, whether we're going to, have to put them back on hay and how I was going to keep them there if I did. Um, just wanted to talk about it so that you all know we're all sort of in this together. Um, if you turned out cows about the time I did, uh, I, I'm seeing that. If you've got good growth and everything's good, then, then congratulations, you're doing better than I am. If you held on to them until May 1st, don't be sorry that you did that because it's been a rough two weeks here getting animals through and 
making sure we've got enough grass. It's going to explode here at some point. I figured by this time in the month, we would be starting to talk about the spring flush, but just been a slow start. And just so all of you know, we're all in this together. So I'm getting to the topic that I really want to discuss this week, keeping management intensive grazing affordable. This is a topic that I picked out when we started doing these web presentations. I actually had this one kind of on the books for uh, an indoor meeting or a pasture walk. And, and I, I will still keep it in mind for that because I'm not even going to be able to get close to covering it all in the time that I've allotted for today. So the, the, the reason I wanted to talk about it is because we get all kinds of questions in here about the latest, greatest fencing equipment or forage seed or whatever that we were trying to get sold to us and, and i always caution that with we can't forget why we're doing this we're doing this we're doing management intensive grazing because we're trying to be profitable we're trying to be profitable and we're trying to do that on a per acre basis so we we have to look at every one of those new fancy things or investments um, based on is our grazing, is the grazing management going to afford that? Is it going to pay for that new improvement? So when when faced with a, a problem like that, I, I read a lot of, I read a lot of Alan Nation's books, and I don't know where he got this, but I think it was from New Zealand. He always said the New Zealand um, problem solving method was to ask two questions. Is, is this a problem? And then is there a low or no cost solution to the problem? And if the answer was yes to it's a problem, then and then the answer was no to there is no low or no cost solution, then we go back to question number one: Is this a problem? Um, I like to find the low cost solution. Now you know we've got some expensive toys here and there at home, um, but we have to remember that we're doing this for overall profitability. So we have to think when we're, we're looking at the newest wonder grass or fertilizer or grazing equipment, we, we have to stop looking for a solution in a purchased product and start looking for a solution with our livestock and with our management. It's our management and our livestock that are really going to make the big impacts in our operation, not the purchase things so often. So often there are low cost solutions to to what we do, it's really the management and the livestock that are going to make the difference. <clears throat> we we also have to look at the difference between the value and the price. And we're going to talk a little bit later about some luxury items that I've got at home and why we have them. But in everything that we do, and, and especially in farming, I, I look at the difference between the value and the price. Sometimes the price tag is a little higher, but sometimes the value is a whole lot higher. And like I mentioned, we're, we're looking at this as a cost per acre versus a return per acre. So, you know, an item may be very expensive at the onset, but if we divide that out over the acres that we're managing and the profit that we're producing per acre, sometimes those expensive items don't seem so. And then I get questions about how to, to buy things or purchase things for grazing uh how, how do we how do we do that how do we quantify that so my rule of thumb is if i was not management intensive grazing uh i would be at about 40 percent utilization rate by moving cows every day or every 12 hours i'm getting up to that 70 80 percent utilization rate so i basically doubled my production on the farm so that doubling in production is kind of where i like to keep my cost range for the year on improvements i actually like to keep it way lower than that but that is the one place that I can kind of point to and say, okay, well, I increased by this much by grazing, and I can afford to invest a little bit of that money in making my grazing more efficient. And while we're on that thought, um, think about it too, as if we've doubled our production, we've doubled, doubled our profitability, we've also doubled basically the land that we have. If we've got 100 acres and we're grazing it continuous and our utilization rate's 40%, now we go to once a day moves, we turn our utilization rate to 80%. We've basically effectively doubled our land value for the cost that it took us to get to that once a day move level. Just an interesting thought. We think about that with heavy use pads too. If we tear up two acres every winter, 
how many times, how many years do we have to tear up those two acres that we, when we, to when we could afford to put in a heavy use pad of some kind that would take up a small amount of acreage and, and save those couple acres we would have torn up in the winter. As I put this slide set together, uh, I had a lot of other slides in here and other things I wanted to think about. And like I said, we're going we're gonna to kind of continue this topic at a later time. But think about the differences in grazing uh, being the differences between portable and permanent a lot of times. A lot of times we're using portable fencing or portable water systems because we're not wanting to invest the cost in having a permanent water system in every individual paddock. We're taking that portable system around and using it in each paddock and therefore saving the cost that it would cost us to put it in as, as permanent. So I think about that whenever it's a purchase for us, is it going to benefit the entire pasture as well uh, for, for what I'm about to pay for? Uh, that can't always justify or not justify the purchase, but it's a good way to measure um, what we're doing and what we're spending money on to improve our grazing system. And then for me, portable comes down to, I have a lot of luxury items that, that help me manage our pastures. And I realize they're luxury items, but for me, I work 40 hours a week. Uh, I can't be home eight hours during the day. So I've got to have some ways to make things move a little faster. So I've got an ATV, I've got a bunch of geared reels. I think somewhere around 24 different geared reels. And, and I could get away with the electric cord reels that other folks use, and, and they're great. Don't get me wrong. I used them for years. But for me, it's a time savings. And we go back to that value versus price. I, uh, my, my, my wife calls me Wreck-It Ralph. Uh, I, I tend to break things quite often, and those electric cord reels just didn't last long enough for me. So the $60 geared reel that I can buy uh, will last. I've got some that are 10 years old where a uh, extension cord reel, by the time I went through a year or two out there in the sun, they were breaking down and, and we weren't able to use them. So I, I do with those, I, it's just easier for me. And in the long run, it's a value and a price thing. I've got a bunch of above ground water lines that we, some of them that we move, some of them we don't move, some of them are permanent. Um, those are just luxury items so that I can move the cows and, and have a whole lot more management with what I do. I've got a big fence charger. In fact, I've got two of them. Both of them have charger remotes now uh, because I, I can take that remote, push it on the fence, turn the fence off at anywhere that I'm at. If I'm riding a four-wheeler by, I hear the fence popping somewhere, I can turn the fence off, fix it, turn it back on, saves me a trip back to the barn. For that $100 that extra remote cost me, uh, it saves me millions of trips back to the barn to be able to turn the fence off and go back to the field. Uh, I would love to get to a point where I could keep that with me on the four-wheeler in a safe place so that I could just turn the fence off, do whatever I'm doing with the animals, and turn it back on again. I haven't got there yet, but I will. And part of the reason why I decided to do this presentation was because I was considering, and I'm still considering, the purchase of some bat latches. Um, they're made by Gallagher. They're solar-charged fence openers, basically. They open a slinky gate or spring gate to allow the cows to move forward. And this would let me set the latch so that it can open in the morning and I wouldn't have to go out and move cows in the morning before I go to work. Or I can set it to move the cows during the day if I wanna get a higher stocking density. And we're gonna talk about why I would wanna do that probably next week. We're gonna talk about stepping up our grazing game, but uh, these are just kind of costs that I look at. And they're yes, they're luxury items, but they help me manage my operation better given that I have to go to work every day and, and be away from the farm. I thought I'd end this presentation with a quote that I've read several places from Jim Garrish. I've heard it from Jim Garrish before on videos and uh, just think it lends perspective to the topic we were kind of talking about here. But the more petroleum and iron we put between the sun's solar energy and your cow's belly, the less profitable you will be. And I can't put it any plainer than that. Um, along with the rain and the soil, uh, anything we put between them, the less profitable we're going to end up being. And I don't mean for this presentation to say that we shouldn't purchase things. That's, that's, that can't be further from the truth. What I am saying is we have to 
be mindful about our operation and our own profitability and purchase the things that are going to do us some good and make our operation better. Well, that's a wrap for this week's web presentation. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we'll end, as always, by thanking our sponsors. And thank you to all those of you out there who have been tuning in and listening to our presentations. As always, keep those suggestions, questions, comments coming. We love to hear them. We love to put together other presentations that are meaningful to folks uh, if they've got any questions or what have you. So with that, we'll see you all next time.